The Adventures of Captain Underpants, an epic novel by Dav Pinkley. Cha la la. Chapter one, George and Harold. Meet George Beard and Harold Hutchkins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. Flower shop, pick your own roses. George and Harold were best friends. They had a lot in common. They lived right next door to each other, and they were both in the same fourth grade class of Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. George and Harold were responsible kids. Whenever anything bad happened, George and Harold were usually responsible. But don't get the wrong idea about these two. George and Harold were actually very nice boys. No matter what everybody else thought, they were good, sweet, and lovable. Well, okay, maybe they weren't so sweet and lovable, but they were good nonetheless. Flower shop. Pick our noses. It's just that George and Harold each had a silly streak a mile long. Usually the silly streak was hard to control. Sometimes it got them into big trouble. And once it got them into big, big trouble... But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 2, Treehouse Comics Incorporated. After a hard day of cracking jokes, pulling pranks, and causing mayhem at school, George and Harold liked to rush to the old treehouse in George's backyard. Inside the treehouse were two big old fluffy chairs, a table, a cupboard crammed with junk food, and a padlock crate filled with pencils, pens, and stacks and stacks of paper. Now Harold loved to draw, and George loved to make up stories, and together the two boys spent hours and hours writing and drawing their very own comic books. Over the years, they created hundreds of their own comics, starring dozens of their own superheroes. First there was Dogman, then came Timmy the Talking Toilet, and who could forget the amazing Cow Lady. But the all-time greatest superhero they ever made up had to be Captain Underpants. George came up with the idea. Most superheroes look like they're flying around in their underwear, he said. Well, what if this guy is flying around in his underwear? The two boys laughed and laughed. Yeah, said Harold. He could fight with wedgie power. George and Harold spent entire afternoons writing and drawing the comic adventures of Captain Underpants. He was the coolest superhero ever. Luckily for the boys, the secretary at Horowitz Elementary School was much too busy to keep an eye on the copy machine. So whenever they got a chance, Harold and George would sneak in the office and run off several hundred copies of their latest Captain Underpants adventure. After school, they sold their homemade comics on the playground for 50 cents each. Chapter 3. The Adventures of Captain Underpants the Really Cool Adventures of Captain Underpants, written by George Beard, drawn by Harold Hutchkins. It was a time of darkness and despair for the planet Earth. Bad guys had taken over the streets, and all of the superheroes in the world were too old to fight evil. Hey! Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Then along came a new, improved, extra-strength superhero. Sha la la Look! Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, uh, it's an egg salad sandwich. No way, I'm Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants leaps faster than a speeding waistband, more powerful than boxer shorts, and able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. Tra la la. Night and day, Captain Underpants watched over the city, fighting for truth, justice, and all that is pre shrunk and cottony. Meanwhile, at a nearby elementary school, it was Stinky Taco Surprise Day at the cafeteria. Yuck! Everybody hated it so much they all threw it away. Soon the cafeteria food came to life. I am the inedible honk. The monster ran around the school, eating everything in sight. Munch! Help! The inedible hunk just ate up 15 folding chairs and the gym teacher. 
Oh, no, not the folding chairs. This looks like a job for, cha-la-la, Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants shot lots of underwear at the monster, but it didn't do any good. Munch, munch. So Captain Underpants took off running. The inedible hunk chased him. Grrr, help, and chased him, and chased him. Finally, the inedible hunk was too tired and thirsty to chase Captain Underpants. How about a nice drink of water? And then, so the monster took a long drink from a shiny white bowl, when suddenly, flush! Away for Captain Underpants! And so the inedible hulk, hunk got flushed away and was never heard from again. Cha-la-la! The end. Don't meet our, miss our next exciting adventure, Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets, coming soon to a playground near you. Treehouse Comics Incorporated. Chapter 4. Mean Old Mr. Krupp. Do you see that old guy looking out the window up there? That's Mr. Krupp, the principal. Now, Mr. Krupp was the meanest, sourest old principal in the whole history of Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. He hated laughter and singing. He hated the sound of children playing at recess. In fact, he hated children altogether. And guess which two children Mr. Krupp hated most of all? If you guessed George and Harold, you're right. Mr. Krupp hated George and Harold. He hated their pranks and their wisecracks. He hated their silly attitudes and the constant giggling. And he especially hated those Captain Underpants comic books. I'm gonna get those boys one day, Mr. Krupp vowed. One day, very, very soon. Kneel here. Chapter 5. One day, very, very soon. Remember I said that George and Harold's silly streak both got them into big, big trouble once? Well, this is the story of how that happened, and how huge pranks and a little blackmail turned their principal into the coolest superhero of all time. It was the day of the big football game between the Horowitz knuckleheads and the Stubbinville stink bugs. The bleachers were filled with fans. Jerome Horowitz Elementary. See our big football game today. The cheerleaders ran onto the field and shook their pom-poms over their heads. A fine black dust drifted out of their pom-poms and set it all around them. Give me a K, shouted the cheerleaders. K, repeated the fans. Give me an N, shouted the cheerleaders. N, repeated the fans. Give me a... Uh, uh, achoo, sneezed the cheerleaders. Uh, uh, achoo, replied the fans. The cheerleaders sneezed and sneezed and sneezed some more. They couldn't stop sneezing. Hey, sprinkled a fan from the bleachers. Somebody sprinkled black pepper into the cheerleaders' pom-poms. I wonder who did that, asked another fan. The cheerleaders stumbled off the field, sneezing and dripping with mucus, as the marching band members took their places. But when the band began to play, steady streams of bubbles began blowing out of their instruments. Bubbles were everywhere. Up and down the field, the marching band slipped and slid, leaving behind a thick trail of wet, bubbly foam. Hey, shouted a fan in the bleachers. Somebody poured bubble bath into the marching band's instruments. I wonder who did that, asked another fan. Soon the football teams took the field. The knuckleheads kicked the ball. Up, up, up went the ball. Higher and higher it went. The ball sailed into the clouds and kept right on going until nobody could see it anymore. Hey, shouted a fan in the bleachers. Somebody filled the game ball with helium. I wonder who did that, asked another fan. But the missing ball didn't make any difference because at that moment, the knuckleheads were rolling around the field, scratching and itching like crazy. Hey, shouted the coach. Somebody replaced our deep heating muscle rub lotion with Mr. Prankster's extra scratchy, itchy cream. We wonder who did that, shouted the fans in the bleachers. The whole afternoon went out much the same way, with people shouting everything from, 
Hey, somebody put sea monkeys in the lemonade, to Hey, somebody glued all the bathroom doors shut. Before long, most of the fans in the bleachers had gotten up and left. The big game had been forfeited, and everybody in the entire school was miserable. Jerome Horowitz Elementary. Boy, our feet smell bad. Everyone, that is, except for two giggling boys crouched in the shadows beneath the bleachers. Those were our best pranks yet, laughed Harold. Yep, chuckled George. They'll be hard to top, that's for sure. I just hope we don't get busted for this, said Harold. Don't worry, said George. We covered our tracks really well. There's no way we'll get busted. The next chapter six. Busted! The next day at school, an announcement came out over the loudspeakers. George Beard and Harold Hutchkins, please report to Principal Krupp's office at once. Uh Uh-oh, said Harold. I don't like the sound of that. Don't worry, said George. They can't prove anything. George and Harold entered Principal Krupp's office and sat down on the chairs in front of his desk. The two boys had been in the office together countless times before, but this time was different. Mr. Krupp was smiling. As long as George and Harold had ever known Mr. Krupp, they had never, ever seen him smile. Mr. Krupp knew something. I didn't see you boys at the big game yesterday, said Mr. Krupp. Uh, no, said George. We weren't feeling well. Yeah, Harold stammered. We we went home. Ah, oh, that's too bad, said Principal Krupp. You boys missed a good game. George and Harold quickly glanced at each other, gulped, and tried hard not to look guilty. Lucky for you, I have a videotape of the whole thing, Mr. Krupp said. He turned on the television in the corner and pressed the play button on his VCR. A black and white image appeared on the TV screen. It was an overhead shot of George and Harold sprinkling pepper into the cheerleaders' pom-poms. Next came a shot of George and Harold pouring liquid bubble bath into the marching band's instruments. How do you like that pre-game show? asked Mr. Krupp with a devilish grin. George eyed the television screen in terror. He couldn't answer. Harold's eyes were glued to the floor. He couldn't look. The tape went on and on, revealing all of George and Harold's behind-the-scene antics. By now, both boys were eyeing the floor, squirming nervously and dripping with sweat. Mr. Krupp turned off the TV. You know, he said, ever since you boys came to this school, it's been one prank after another. First you put dissected frogs in the jello salad at the parent-teacher banquet. Then you made it snow in the cafeteria. Then you rigged all of the... Intercom, so they played Weird Al Yankovic songs at full blast for six hours straight. For four long years, you two have been running amok in this school, and I've never been able to prove anything. Until now! Mr. Krupp held the videotape in his hand. I took the liberty of installing tiny video surveillance cameras all around the school. I knew I'd catch you two in the act one day. I just didn't know it would be so easy. Chapter 7. Little Blackmail Mr. Krupp sat back in his chair and chuckled to himself for a long, long time. Finally, George got up the courage to speak. What are you going to do with that tape? he asked. I thought you'd never ask, laughed Principal Krupp. I've thought long and hard about what to do with this tape, Mr. Krupp said. At first, I thought I'd send copies to your parents. The boys swallowed hard and sank deeply into their chairs. Then I thought I might send a copy to the school board, Mr. Krupp continued. I could get you both expelled for this. The boys swallowed harder and sank deeper into their chairs. Finally, I came to a decision, Mr. Krupp concluded. I think the football team would be very curious to find out just who was responsible for yesterday's fiasco. I think I'll send a copy to them. George and Harold leaped out of their chairs and fell to their knees. No, cried George. You can't do that. They'll kill us. Yeah, begged Harold. They'll kill us every day for the rest of our lives. Mr. Crop laughed and laughed. 
Please have mercy, the boys cried. We'll do anything. Anything? asked Principal Crop with delight. He reached into his desk, pulled out a list of demands, and tossed it to the boys. If you don't want to be dead, as long as you live, you'll follow these rules. Exactly. George and Harold carefully looked over the list. This this is blackmail, said George. Call it what you like, Principal Crop snapped. But if you two don't follow that list exactly, this tape becomes a property of the Horowitz knuckleheads. Rules. Number one, no more practical jokes or pranks. Number two, no laughing or smiling. Number three, no more. Eh. Chapter f- number four, no more. Eh. Captain eh. underpants. Number five, wash my eh. car every. Eh. Number six, mow my. Eh. Chapter eight, crime and punishment. At six o'clock the next morning, George and Harold dragged themselves out of bed, walked over to Mr. Krupp's house, and began washing his car. Then, while Harold scrubbed the tires, George roamed around the yard, pulling up all the weeds and crabgrass he could find. Afterwards, they cleaned the gutters and washed all the windows in Mr. Krupp's house. At school, George and Harold sat up straight, listened carefully, and spoke only when spoken to. They didn't tell jokes, they didn't pull pranks, they didn't even smile. The teacher kept pinching herself. I just know this is a dream, she said. At lunch, the two boys vacuumed Mr. Krupp's office, shined his shoes, and polished his desktop. At recess, they clipped his fingernails and ironed his tie. Each spare moment of the boys' daily schedule was spent catering to Mr. Krupp's every whim. After school, George and Harold mowed Mr. Krupp's lawn, tended his garden, and began painting the front of his house. At sunset, Mr. Krupp came outside and handed each boy a stack of books. Gentlemen, he said, I've asked your teachers to give you both extra homework. Now go home, study hard, and I'll see you back here at six o'clock tomorrow morning. we got a busy day ahead of us. Thank you, sir, moaned the two boys. George and Harold walked home, dead tired. Man, this is the worst day of my entire life, said George. Don't worry, said Harold. We only have to do this for eight more years. Then we can move away to some far-off land where they'll never find us. Maybe Antarctica. I've got a better idea, said George. He took out a piece of paper from his pocket and handed it to Harold. It was an old magazine ad for a 3D hypno ring. How is this going to help us, asked Harold. All we got to do is hypnotize Mr. Krupp, said George, and we'll make him give us a video and forget this whole mess ever happened. That's a great idea, said Harold. And the best part is we only have to wait four to six weeks for delivery. Hey, kids, it's the 3D Hypno Ring. Learn the art of hypnosis. Amaze your friends. Control your enemies. Rule the world. It's easy. It's only $2.99 plus $1.01 shipping and handling. Chapter 9. Four to six weeks later. After four to six weeks of Backbreaking slave labor, grueling homework assignments, and humiliating good behavior at school, a package arrived in George's mailbox from the Little Wise Guy Novelty Company. It was a 3D hypno ring. Hallelujah, cried George. It's everything I hoped for. Let me see, let me see, said Harold. Don't look directly at it, warned George. You don't want to get hypnotized, do you? Do you really think it'll work, asked Harold. Do you really think we can amaze our friends, control our enemies, and take over the world, just like the ad said? It better work, said George, or else we just wasted four whole bucks. Chapter 10. The 3D Hypno Ring The next morning, George and Harold didn't arrive early at Mr. Krupp's house to wash his car and reshingle his roof. In fact, they were even a little late getting to school. When they finally showed up, Mr. Krupp was standing in the front door waiting for them. And boy, was he mad. Mr. Krupp escorted the boys into his office and slammed the door. All right, where were you two this morning, he growled. We wanted to come over to your house, said George, but we were busy trying to figure out the secret of this ring. What ring? snapped Mr. Krupp. George held up his hand and showed the ring to Principal Krupp. 
It's got one of those weird patterns on it, said Harold. If you stare at it long enough, a picture appears. Well, hold it still, snarled Mr. Crop. I can't see the darn thing. I'll have to move it back and forth, said George, or else it won't work. Mr. Crop's eyes followed the ring back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. You have to stare deeper into the ring, said Harold. Deeper, 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 deeper. You are getting sleepy, said George. Very sleepy. Mr. Crop's eyelids began to droop. Oh, I'm so sleepy, he mumbled. After a few minutes, Mr. Crop's eyes were closed tight, and he began to snore. You are under our spell, said George. When I snap my fingers, you will obey our every command. Snap! I will obey, mumbled Mr. Crop. All right, said George. Have you still got that videotape of me and Harold? Yes, mumbled Mr. Crop. Well, hand it over, bub, George instructed. Mr. Crop unlocked a large file cabinet and opened the bottom drawer. He reached in and handed George the videotape. George stuffed it in his backpack. Harold took a different video out of his backpack and put it in the file cabinet. What's on that video? asked George. It's one of my little sister's old Boomer the Purple Dragon sing-along videos. Nice touch, said George. Chapter 11. Fun with Hypnosis. When Harold bent down to close the cabinet, he took a quick look inside. Whoa, he cried. Look at all the stuff in here. The file cabinet was filled with everything Mr. Crop had taken away from the boys over the year. There were slingshots, whoopee cushions, skateboards, fake doggy doo doo. You name it, it was in there. Look at this, cried George. A big stack of Captain Underpants comics. He's got every issue, said Harold. For hours, the two boys sat on the floor laughing and reading their comics. Finally, George looked up at the clock. Yikes, he said. It's almost lunchtime. We better clean up this mess and get to class. The boys looked at their principal, who had been standing behind them in a trance all morning. Gee, I almost forgot Mr. Krupp, said Harold. What should we do with him? Do you want to have some fun? asked George. Why not, said Harold. I haven't had any fun in the last four to six weeks. Cool, said George. He walked up to Mr. Crop and snapped his fingers. Snap! You are a chicken, he said. Suddenly, Mr. Crop leaped onto his desk and flapped his arms. Cluck, 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 he cried, kicking his papers off the desk behind him and pecking at the, his pen and paper set. George and Harold howled with laughter. Let me try, let me try, said Harold. Um, you are a monkey. You gotta snap your fingers, said George. Oh, yeah, said Harold. You are a monkey. Suddenly, Mr. Crupp swung, sprang off his desk and began swinging from the fluorescent light fixtures. Woo, 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 he, squee he squeaked, leaping from one side of the room to the other. George and Harold laughed so hard they almost cried. My turn, my turn, said George. Let's see, what should we turn him into next? I know, Harold said, holding up a Captain Underpants ca comic. Let's turn him, t him into Captain Underpants. Good idea, said George. You are now the greatest superhero of all time, the amazing Captain Underpants. Mr. Crop tore down the red curtains from his office window and tied it around his neck, then took off his socks, shoes, shirts, pants, and his awful toupee. Tra-la-la, he sang. Mr. Crop stood before them looking quite triumphant, with his cape blowing in the breeze of the open window. George and Harold were dumbfounded. You know, said George, he kind of looks like Captain Underpants. Yeah, Harold replied. After a short silence, the boys looked at each other and burst into laughter. George and Harold had never laughed so hard in their lives. Tears ran down their faces as they rolled around the floor, shrieking in hysterics. After a while, George pulled himself off the floor for another look. Hey, George cried. Where'd he go? George and Harold dashed to the window and looked out. 
There, running across the parking lot, was a pudgy old guy in his underwear with a red cape flowing behind him. Tra-la-la! Mr. Crop, come back, shouted Harold. He won't answer to that, said George. He thinks it's Captain Underpants now. Oh, no, said Harold. He's probably running off to fight crime, said George. Oh, no, said Harold. And we gotta stop him, said George. Oh, no, cried Harold. No way. Look, said George, he could get killed out there. Harold was unmoved. Or worse, said George, we could get in big trouble. You're right, said Harold. We gotta go after him. The two boys opened the bottom file cabinet drawer and took out their slingshots and skateboards. You think we should bring anything out, said Harold? Yeah, said George. Let's bring the fake doggy doo-doo. Good thinking, said Harold. You just never know when fake doggy doo-doo is going to come in handy. Harold stuffed Mr. Crop's clothes, shoes, and toupee into his backpack. Then together, the two boys leaped out the window, skid, slid down the flagpole, and took off on their skateboards after the amazing Captain Underpants. Chapter 11, Bank Robbers. George and Harold rode their skateboards all over town looking for Captain Underpants. I can't find him anywhere, said Harold. You'd think a guy like him would be easy to spot, said George. Then the boys turned a corner, and there he was. Captain Underpants was standing in front of a bank, looking quite heroic. Mr. Crop, cried Harold. Shh, said George. Don't call him that. Call him Captain Underpants. Oh, yeah, said Harold. And don't forget to snap your fingers, said George. Right, said Harold. But before he got a chance, the bank doors flew wide open and out stepped two robbers. The robbers took one look at Captain Underpants and stopped dead in their tracks. Surrender, cried, said Captain Underpants, or I will have to resort to wedgie power. Oh, no, whispered Harold and George. Nobody moved for about ten seconds. Finally, the robbers looked at each other and burst out laughing. They dropped their loot and fell in the sidewalk, screaming in hysterics. Almost immediately, the cops showed up and arrested the crooks. Let that be a lesson to you, said Captain Underpants. Never underestimate the power of underwear. The police chief, looking quite angry, marched over to Captain Underpants. Just who the heck are you supposed to be, the police chief demanded. Why, I'm Captain Underpants, the world's greatest superhero, said Captain Underpants. I fight for truth. Justice, and all that is pre-shunk and cottony. Oh, yeah, shouted the police chief. Cuff him, boys. One of the cops took out his handcuffs and grabbed Captain Underpants by the arms. Uh-oh, cried George. We got a roll. Together, the two boys zoomed into the crowd, weaving in and out of cops and bystanders. Harold skated up to Captain Underpants and knocked the superhero off his feet. George caught him, and the boys skated away with the Captain Underpants on their shoulders. Stop, cried the cops, but it was too late. George, Harold, and Captain Underpants were gone. Chapter 14, The Big Bang. After their quick escape, George, Harold, and Captain Underpants stopped on a deserted street corner to catch their breath. Okay, said George. Let's dehypnotize them quick before something else... Kaboom! Happens. A huge explosion came from the rare crystal shop across the street. Heavy smoke poured out of the building. Suddenly, two robots with one stolen crystal emerged from the smoke and jumped into an old van. Did I just see two robots get into a van? asked Harold. You know, said George, up until now the story was almost believable. Well, believable or not, said Harold, we are not getting involved. I repeat, we are not getting involved. Just then, Captain Underpants leaped from the street corner and dashed in front of the van. Stop! In the name of underwear, he cried. Uh-oh, said George. I think we're involved. The two robots started up the van and swerved around Captain Underpants. Unfortunately, the van brushed up against his red cape and it got caught. With a mighty jerk, Captain Underpants flipped backwards and the van pulled him along as it drove away. Grab him, cried George. The two boys skateboarded with all their might towards the speeding vans and grabbed Captain Underpants by the ankles. Help! they cried as the van pulled them through the city streets. Mommy, said a little boy sitting on the bench. 
I just saw two robots driving a van with a guy in his underwear hanging off the back by a red cape, pulling two boys on skateboards behind him with his feet. How do you expect me to believe such a ridiculous story? said his mother. Finally, the van came to a screeching halt in front of an old abandoned warehouse. A sudden stop made Captain Underpants flip over the roof of the van and crash through the front door of the building. Well, 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 said a strange voice from inside the warehouse. It looks as if we have a visitor. Chapter 15. Dr. Diaper. George and Harold hid behind the van until the coast was clear. Then they sneaked up to the hole in the door and peeked inside. Captain Underpants was all tied up, the two robots were standing guard, and the strange little man wearing a diaper was laughing maniacally. I am the evil Dr. Diaper, the strange little man told Captain Underpants, and you will be the first to witness my takeover of the world. Dr. Diaper placed the stolen crystal into the large machine called the Lasermatic 2000. The machine started to light up and make loud noises. Heavy gears began shifting and spinning and a laser beam from the crystal shot straight up through a hole in the roof. In exactly 20 minutes, this laser beam will blow up the moon and send huge chunks of it crashing down upon every major city in the world, laughed Dr. Diaper. Then I will rise from the rubble and take over the planet. Only one thing can help us now, said George. What? asked Harold. Rubber doggy doo-doo, said George. Harold took the fake doggy, doggy doo doo and a slingshot from George's backpack and handed them to him. Be careful, said Harold. The fate of the entire planet is in your hands. With careful and precise aim, George shot the rubber doo doo through the air and across the room and landed with a plop right at the feet of Dr. Diaper. Yes, whispered George and Harold. Dr. Diaper looked down at the doo doo between his feet and turned bright red. Ah, oh, dear me, he cried. I'm dreadfully embarrassed. Please excuse me. He began to waddle towards the restroom. This has never happened to me before, I assure you, he said. I I guess with all the excitement, I just... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. While Dr. Diaper was off changing himself, George and Harold sneaked into the old warehouse. Immediately, the robots detected the boys and began marching towards them. Destroy the intruders, said the robots. Destroy the intruders. George and Harold screamed and ran to the back of the warehouse. Luckily, George found two old boards and gave one of them to Harold. We're not going to have to resort to extremely graphic violence, are we? asked Harold. I sure hope not, said George. Chapter 16, the extremely graphic violence chapter. Warning, the following chapter contains graphic scenes showing two boys beating the tar out of a couple of robots. If you have high blood pressure, or if you faint at the sight of motor oil... We strongly urge you to take better care of yourself and stop being such a baby. Fliporama explanation, which we already know. Robot Rampage! Robot Rampage! George saves Harold! Prunk. Harold returns a favor! Bonk! Mixed nuts and bolts. Donk, donk, donk. Donk, donk, donk. Chapter 17. The Escape. After defeating the robots, George and Harold untied Captain Underpants. Come on, cried Harold. Let's get out of here. Wait, said Captain Underpants. We have to save the world first. So George, Harold, and Captain Underpants frantically looked all over the Laser Matic 2000, searching for a way to shut it down and stop the inevitable disaster. Um, said Harold, I think this might be the lever we want. He pulled the self-destruct lever with all his might. Suddenly, the Lasermatic 2000 began to sputter and shake. The huge laser beam turned off, and the pieces of the machine began flying off in all directions. It's gonna blow, cried Harold. Run for your lives! Not so fast, screamed Dr. Diaper, who had appeared out of nowhere. You demolished my robots. You destroyed my Lasermatic 2000. And you ruined my one chance to take over the world. But you won't live to tell the tale. Dr. Diaper pulled out his Diapermatic 2000 ray gun and pointed it at George, Harold, and Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants quickly stretched a pair of underwear and shot it at Dr. Diaper. 
The underwear landed right on the evil doctor's head. Help! cried Dr. Diaper. I can't see, I can't see! George and Harold ran out of the warehouse as fast as they could. Great shot, Captain Underpants, cried Harold. There's just one thing I don't understand, said George. Where, where did you get the extra pair of underwear? What extra pair, said Captain Underpants. Wah! Never mind that, said George. Let's just get out of here before that lasermatic thing ex Kaboom! The laser mag 2000 blew up, tearing apart the old warehouse. It set flaming hearts, shards of red-hot metal in every direction. Fire fell from the skies around our heroes, and the earth began to crumble. Oh no, cried Harold. We're doomed! Chapter 18. To make a long story short. Chapter 19. Back to school. George, Harold, and Captain Underpants made a quick stop outside the police station. They tied Dr. Diaper to a lamppost and attached a note to him. There, said Captain Underpants. That ought to explain everything. It says, arrest me. Then George and Harold led Captain Underpants back to Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. Why are we going here? asked Captain Underpants. Well, said George, you have to do some undercover work here. Yeah, said Harold, reaching into his backpack. Put these clothes on and make it snappy. Don't forget your hair, said George. Captain Underpants quickly got dressed behind some bushes. Well, how do I look? he asked. Pretty good, said George. Now try looking really mad. Captain Underpants made the nastiest face he could. You know, said Harold, he kind of looks like Mr. Krupp. Harold, whispered George. He is Mr. Krupp. Oh, yeah, said Harold. I almost forgot. Before long, they were back inside Mr. Krupp's office. Okay, Captain Underpants, said George. You are now Mr. Krupp. Snap your fingers, whispered Harold. Oh, yeah, said George. You are now Mr. Krupp. Who's Mr. Krupp? asked Captain Underpants. Oh, no, cried Harold. It's not working. The boys tried again and again to dehypnotize Captain Underpants, but nothing seemed to work. Hmm, said Harold. Let me see the instruction manual for that ring. George checked his pants pockets. Um, said George, I think I lost it. You what? cried Harold. The two boys shook, searched frantically through the office, but the 3D hypno ring instruction manual was nowhere to be found. Never mind, said George. I have an idea. He removed the flowers from a large vase in the corner. Then he poured all the water over Captain Underpants' head. What'd you do that for? cried Harold. I saw it in a cartoon once, said George. So it's gotta work. After a few minutes, Mr. Krupp slowly came to. What's going on here? he demanded. And why am I all wet? George and Harold had never been so glad to see Mr. Krupp in all their lives. I'm so happy I could cry, said Harold. Well, you're gonna cry when I give that videotape to the football team, shouted Mr. Krupp. I've had it with you two. Principal Krupp took the videotape out of his filing cabinet. You boys are dead meat, he sneered. He stormed out of the office with the video and headed towards the gym. Harold and George smiled. Wait till the football team sees that video, said Harold. Yeah, said George. I sure hope they like singing Purple Dragon. Now look, said George. I found the 3D Hypno Ring instruction manual. It was in my shirt pocket, not my pants pocket. Well, throw that thing away, said Harold. We'll never need it again. I sure hope not, said George. Chapter 20. The End? Question mark? Things at Jerome Horowitz School were never quite the same after that faithful day. The football team enjoys Mr. Krupp's video so much that they changed their name from the Knuckleheads to the Purple Dragon Sing Along Friends. The name change didn't go over well with the fans, but hey, who's going to argue with a bunch of linebackers? George and Harold went back to their old ways, pulling pranks, cracking jokes, and making new comic books. They had to keep an eye on Mr. Krupp, though. Because, for some strange reason, every time he heard the sounds of fingers snapping, Mr. Principal Krupp turned back into... You know who? Oh no, cried Harold. Here we go again, said George. Tra-la-la! The end. Oh, and I wrote you a note. The universe can kind of, sort of, be understood... I think it's cooler to understand than believe.
Love, Jamie. I don't remember doing that, but there you go. Hope you enjoyed.